Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Considering that many of us haven't been able to do much outside of the house for the past year and a half, it's understandable that a lot of people are feeling sentimental about things like large live events. There's nothing quite like the feeling of experiencing a huge spectacle amidst the energy of hundreds or even thousands of other people, especially since so much of the last year has been characterized by the distinct absence of human connection. It's perhaps for this reason, as restaurants, bars, and entertainment of all kinds are slowly coming back to life, that last week's tragedy at the Astroworld Festival in Houston feels so profoundly sad. If you're not familiar with what happened, Eight people lost their lives, and many others were injured as concertgoers were caught in a terrifying asphyxiation pileup as fans rushed the stage during Travis Scott's performance. It's almost as if, just when things feel like they might be getting back to normal, life has a funny way of reminding us that tragedy can happen anywhere and at any time. Though it's probably too early to get too far into the specifics of what happened at the Astro World Festival, it seems clear that there will be a long road ahead for trying to fully understand the devastating events. With that in mind, today we wanted to bring you the story of a similar, albeit far more deadly event. One that illustrates just how long and controversial the fight for justice in these kinds of tragic situations can be. Before we get to today's story, if you enjoy our videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, this is The Hillsborough Disaster. On the afternoon of Saturday, April 15th, 1989, a crowd of excited sports fans began to arrive at Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, England. The stadium was hosting a highly anticipated semi-final football association Challenge Cup match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. It was a sold-out game that was set to bring in a combined total of more than 53,000 fans between the two teams. Kickoff was scheduled for 3 p.m. that afternoon, and by midday, eager fans were already streaming in. In the hour leading up to the start of the match, crowds of people waiting to enter had started to form outside of the Leppings Lane entrance to the stadium, which had been allocated solely to Liverpool fans. Things were slow moving, and many fans were struggling to make it past the limited turnstiles that were available for entry relative to the size of the crowd. This was especially true for those who had purchased tickets for the terrace a standing area below the seated sections of the stadium made up of a series of concrete steps that offered a cheaper alternative to the seated sections. Despite this, the mood remained jovial amongst most waiting spectators. It was a bright and sunny day, and people were simply following the flow of the crowd as people continued to move inside. As game time drew nearer, it seemed that efforts were being made to increase the rate at which people were being allowed in, and the flow of the crowd picked up. It seemed like only a matter of time before everyone would be inside the stadium and enjoying themselves. However, what those fans outside the stadium didn't know, what they couldn't have known, was that as they unwittingly streamed into Liverpool's terrace section, a horrifying situation was unfolding. One that would only become deadlier with each passing minute. It turned out that as fans continued to crowd into Liverpool's terrace section, those that were already at the front were being slowly crushed, and because of the way the area had been designed, there was nowhere for them to go. Just six minutes after kickoff, South Yorkshire Police Superintendent Roger Greenwood ran out onto the field to get the referee's attention and to stop the match. However, by that point, it was already too late. Almost a hundred people would be killed as a result of the crushing force of the crowd, and hundreds of others would be injured. The terrifying event would come to be known as the Hillsborough Disaster, and to this day, it's widely regarded as the worst tragedy in the history of British sports. Before we go any further, it's important to point out that for many people, especially the victims' families, the survivors, and others who were directly affected by this awful tragedy, the events of April 15, 1989, have not been fully resolved to this day. Though it's been more than 30 years since the tragedy took place, 
the controversy surrounding it is still very much alive, and for many, so is the fight for justice. Because of that, we wanted to offer something of a disclaimer. This is an incredibly complex topic, and there's no way that we can likely touch on every part of it in a single video. That being said, we think it's an important story, and one that we've tried to cover to the best of our abilities. As another aside, we apologize up front to any viewers outside of North America if we're using different or incorrect terms than you're used to regarding football or parts of the game. We'll probably use soccer and football interchangeably at least once without realizing it, as well as other things we've forgotten to include here. So yeah, sorry in advance. Alright, with that being said, let's continue. In order to fully comprehend what led to the Hillsborough disaster, and what ultimately made it so deadly, we need to first dig into a little bit of background and surrounding context. If you're even slightly familiar with football culture, then chances are you've heard of football hooliganism. Broadly speaking, this refers to a range of violent or antisocial behaviors engaged in by spectators at football events, often carried out by one team's fans against the fans and even players of the opposing side. The full history of hooliganism is too long to get into here, but suffice it to say, to some extent, it's always been part of the game. However, by the 1960s, the UK had a particularly notorious reputation for football hooliganism, so much so that it was commonly referred to as the English disease. Over the next couple of decades, this led to a variety of so-called security upgrades at stadiums across the UK, most of which were designed to segregate the fans of opposing teams from one another, as well as prevent people and objects from getting onto the field. One of the most popular ways to do this was to erect high steel fencing around the terrace levels of stadiums, which prevented fans in these standing areas from easily climbing onto the field or throwing things while the games were in progress. Further fences were later added in some stadiums to divide sections of the terraces themselves, effectively creating three-sided cages that were referred to as pens that restricted the amount that fans could move to the side within the terrace area. This was meant to be an additional means of crowd control. So-called crush barriers were usually installed at a few points along the concrete steps of the terraces to stop crowds from pushing too far forward and to protect people from the slope of the steps. However, despite these limited safety features, it's important to understand that much of the emphasis on crowd control leading up to the events of the Hillsborough disaster was less about ensuring crowd safety than it was about ensuring order. This is particularly true given the fact that the dangers of fencing in spectators like this had been well established by the time of the Hillsborough disaster. The Bradford City Stadium fire of 1985, in which 56 people were killed, was a particularly notable example but there had also been at least one seriously close call at Hillsborough Stadium itself. At a 1981 FA Cup semi-final match between the Wolverhampton Wanderers and Tottenham Hotspur, more people than could be safely accommodated were allowed into the terrace on the Leppings Lane side of the stadium. Though fatalities were narrowly avoided, 38 people were injured, some of whom suffered broken arms, legs, and ribs from being crushed in the overcrowded terrace. Many of the most seriously injured were trapped at the front of the terrace behind its high steel walls, which prevented them from being able to escape. Despite this close call, it apparently had little impact on the mentality of police, who continued to think of hooliganism as the main problem with maintaining crowd safety at football games. It also had little impact on those in charge of the Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, the team based out of Hillsborough Stadium. Their main response to the 1981 incident was to divide the terrace area into three parts to try and restrict the lateral movement of the spectators, believing this would alleviate some of the issues. This meant that there were high steel walls not only in front of spectators in the pens, but also on either side of them. The pens on the Leppings Lane side were further divided in following years. There were seven at the time of the 1989 disaster. Another change made to this side of the stadium concerned pens 3 and 4, the two pens that were located directly behind the West Stand goal. In 1986, a crush barrier near the access tunnel to pens 3 and 4, which was there to prevent injuries resulting from overcrowding, was ironically removed to improve the flow of fans entering and exiting the central enclosure. 
Though these changes that were made to the stadium's terrace invalidated its safety certificate, it was never renewed, nor was the stadium's capacity ever lowered, despite recommendations to do so in the aftermath of the 1981 incident. As previously mentioned, on the day of the semi-final match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, the Liverpool fans were specifically allocated the Leppings Lane entrance, which fed the north and west stands of the stadium. This area had just 23 total turnstiles at its entrances, compared to the 60 on the south and east ends, as well as a capacity of 5,000 fewer people. Despite the fact that more Liverpool fans planned to attend the game, the decision was made by police and event organizers to give the larger area to Nottingham fans, in order to prevent spectators from opposing teams from crossing paths on their approach to the stadium. The Leppings Lane entrance was broken up into two main sets of turnstiles. Numbers 1 to 16 provided access to the 9,700 seats in the North Stand, as well as the approximately 4,500 seats in the West Stand. This left just seven turnstiles, lettered from A to G, to accommodate all roughly 10,100 fans who had tickets for the terrace area. What this meant was that by the time the majority of Liverpool fans began arriving just after 2 p.m., they could not be admitted through the turnstiles fast enough. A bottleneck started to form, which only got worse as some people went to the wrong turnstiles and were unable to turn around because of the growing crowd. Nowhere was this worse than at the seven turnstiles feeding the terrace portion on the Leppings Lane side of the stadium. By 2.30 p.m., less than half of the more than 10,100 ticketed Liverpool fans had been able to make their way into the terrace, and the crowd was only growing larger. At this point, it's worth talking a little bit about the South Yorkshire police, who were supposed to be overseeing crowd control, as well as the staff at Hillsborough Stadium. In charge of the police presence at the stadium that day was Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield. Not only was Duckenfield newly promoted to the position at the time, he had no experience with the Hillsborough Stadium venue and had never worked at a sold-out football game before. The previous person who had held Duckenfield's position, a man named Brian Mole, had actually worked the same semi-final match the previous year but had been transferred to a different division in the wake of a hazing scandal perpetrated by officers under his command. Mole apparently could have been assigned to the planning meetings with organizers of the 1989 game regardless of his transfer, but he was not. This left Duckenfield in command of all officers that day, despite his inexperience. Additionally, we came across in our research that for whatever reason, staff were reportedly not directing fans to less crowded areas of the terrace once they had made it through the turnstiles. This was supposed to be standard practice as the pens filled up, as the barriers between the pens were designed to prevent fans from moving between them once inside. This meant that if fans were to be evenly dispersed, they would need to be directed towards less crowded pens as others began to fill up. This would turn out to be enormously consequential, because as soon as spectators headed towards the terrace on the Leppings Lane side of the stadium after making it through the turnstiles, the first thing they would have seen would have been the access tunnel that led directly to pens 3 and 4, the ones behind the goal. The routes leading to all other pens, especially the far less crowded pens 1 and 2, were poorly marked. In our research, some articles mentioned that there was actually a sign for refreshments that was larger than the ones directing spectators to pens 1 and 2. Without staff or police there to direct fans, there was no way to ensure that they would be evenly distributed across the pens, and no way of counting how many people were heading into each one. As the backlog continued to worsen in the lead-up to kickoff time, Liverpool fans eager to get inside and find a place to stand simply traveled the most direct route available to them down the access tunnel to pens 3 and 4. With limited visibility and mobility because of the crowd, it was impossible to tell that these pens were becoming more and more dangerously overcrowded. Though requests were made by at least one police constable to delay the start of the semi-final match in order to allow for more time for all fans to make it inside, this request was denied. It's unclear why this was the case, especially since this had been done without issue in previous years. By 2.45 p.m., the South Yorkshire police were beginning to grow concerned about the dangerous overcrowding outside of the Leppings Lane side of the stadium, 
particularly around the lettered turnstiles at the entrance to the terrace. The crowd had now wrapped around a sort of funnel-like section next to the turnstiles, and were blocking an area known as Gate C, which was meant to allow fans to exit the stadium. At 2.52 p.m., Duckenfield gave the order to open Gate C and allow fans to enter through this area as well. Eventually, similar gates known as Gates A and B on the numbered turnstile side were opened in a similar fashion. Though opening the gates, especially Gate C, did have the effect of alleviating the buildup outside the stadium, it now meant that there were even more fans streaming into the dangerously overcrowded pens 3 and 4. For those inside the pens, especially anyone closer to the front, the situation had now turned deadly. Pen 3 and 4's official combined capacity was 2200, though as previously mentioned, it was suggested that this should have been lowered. Some estimates say that the real capacity should have been in the range of 1600. Regardless, by kickoff time that afternoon, it's believed that there were well over 3,000 people in these two pens. Realizing the direness of their situation, many of those who had the ability began to try and climb the steel fences of the pen, either into the less crowded pens on either side, or over the top and onto the field. Others were rescued by fans in the seated section above, who began to try and pull people to safety after witnessing people being crushed against the fences below. However, many, many other people were not so lucky. Unable to even lift their arms, they were trapped, totally helpless and struggling to breathe. Initially believing that spectators who were climbing the fences were simply trying to get onto the field to interrupt the match, police were slow to respond with help. In fact, they tried to stop people from getting out of the pens. It wasn't until several minutes into the game, when a crush barrier in Pen 3 collapsed, that they started to realize that something was seriously wrong. At 3.06 p.m., the match was stopped. The collapsing of the crush barrier made things even more dangerous for the terrified people who were trapped there. Many were knocked to the ground and could not get back up, as the crushing weight of more people pushed in. A small gate in the pens was eventually forced open, allowing some people to get out onto the field, while a lucky few were also rescued by fans who had managed to escape and cut holes in the fencing. Many others simply escaped as more of the crush barriers began to collapse, taking the fence with it. Even though police were now actively trying to assist in getting people out of the pens, the situation by this point was total chaos. Even as firefighters and paramedics arrived at the field, most encountered problems getting to where they were actually needed. Of the 42 ambulances that came to the stadium, only three actually made it onto the field. Many paramedics had to make the choice between waiting in their vehicles with their equipment to assist the injured as they were brought out or to try and go in without their equipment to do what they could. Firefighters with cutting equipment faced similar problems trying to get into the stadium to help out. As the chaos continued to play out, many uninjured fans took it upon themselves to try and administer CPR to the wounded, and to create makeshift stretchers out of advertising boards on the field. When the dust had finally settled, 94 people would be dead. More than 750 others were wounded at least 300 of whom were hospitalized. Only a fraction of the deceased victims ever made it to the hospital. They ranged in age from 10 to 67. Four days later, the disaster claimed the life of another victim, 14-year-old Lee Nickel, when the decision was made to turn his life support machine off. It would reach 96 in March of 1993, when it was decided that a young man named Tony Bland was showing no signs of improvement after almost four years in a persistent vegetative state. The reaction in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy was one of overwhelming sadness. Messages of support flooded in from around the world, and a shrine was quickly set up at Anfield Stadium in Liverpool to allow people to collectively grieve. In the days that followed, more than 200,000 people would visit the shrine. Tributes at various places were also held for victims of the tragedy, and a disaster appeal fund was set up that eventually raised over 12 million pounds. However, it quickly became apparent that not everyone shared the belief that the fans were innocent victims of the Hillsborough disaster. In fact, some were prepared to blame them directly for what had happened. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the quickest group to try and paint the Liverpool fans in a negative light were the South Yorkshire police. 
who insisted that the tragedy had been a result of drunkenness and hooliganism. Many, especially those in positions of authority within the police, insisted that it was the behavior of fans that had turned the situation deadly, that they had interfered with the police's ability to maintain control, and that the police had feared for their lives. Chief Superintendent Duckenfield in particular lied about having given the order to open Gate C, telling key people and the media that the gate had instead been forced open by fans. Other members of the police force insisted that it was fans that had tried to gain entry without tickets that had caused the overcrowding. Several media outlets took the police's version of events and immediately ran with it, most notoriously the newspaper outlet The Sun. In a front-page story released just four days after the tragedy, editor Kelvin McKenzie ran the headline, The Truth, followed by shocking accusations against fans. These accusations included that spectators had urinated on police officers, had attacked them while they were trying to perform CPR on the wounded, and that they had even stolen from the bodies of the dead. These allegations were made by, quote, unnamed police officers, as well as conservative MP Irvine Patnick. Though all of these accusations would later be disproven, the combined claims made by the police and the media outlets would prove to be enduring in many places outside of Liverpool. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Lord Justice Taylor was appointed to conduct an inquiry into the events of April 15, 1989. The inquiry spanned two months and produced two reports, an interim report in the summer of 1989 and a final report in early 1990 that came to be known as the Taylor Report. Unlike the story that police officers had told and the media had amplified, Taylor concluded that the primary reason for the Hillsborough disaster was a breakdown in policing and police control. The decision to open Gate C and the other gates was particularly pointed out, as was the decision not to delay the start of the match. Taylor also rejected the idea that police had no reason to anticipate problems that day, since overcrowding and congestion had occurred at Hillsborough in both of the two previous seasons. Taylor called the failure of police to direct fans to empty areas of the stadium, quote, a blunder of the first magnitude, and he also condemned officers for their failure to take responsibility for the events of the day during the process of giving their witness statements. Taylor further criticized the Sheffield Wednesday Football Club for their inadequate number of turnstiles at the Leppings Lane entrance to the stadium, the poor quality of their crush barriers, as well as other features of the stadium design. As for the fans, Taylor concluded that to the extent that drunkenness and hooliganism were present, they were secondary causes at best. He added that based on the available information, however, most fans were not drunk and were consuming the normal amount of alcohol that should have been expected for a sporting activity of this nature. In either case, he stated that this did not rationalize the lack of police control over the situation. Finally, the report suggested that stadiums should get rid of terrace standing areas and move to an all-seater format. Though this suggestion was acted on, and eventually all football clubs in the two top-tier divisions moved to all-seater stadiums, the other conclusions in the report did not result in the outcomes that families had hoped for. In the summer of 1990, the Director of Public Prosecutions ruled out bringing criminal charges against the Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, Sheffield City Council, as well as the stadium safety engineers. Things got even more controversial in March of 1991, when the coroner's report was released and the inquests reached a verdict of accidental death. This was a major blow to the survivors and victims' families, who had hoped that the deaths at Hillsborough would be declared unlawful killings and that manslaughter charges would be brought against the police. A major part of the controversy were the conclusions reached by South Yorkshire coroner, Dr. Stephen Popper, and his decision to limit the main inquest timeline to just 3.15 p.m. on the day of the tragedy. Popper argued that this was because all of the victims were either dead or brain dead by this time. Many who were angered by the verdict believed that this was an arbitrary cutoff time, and that in fact, many of the injured had died after 3.15 p.m., Aside from this, the timeline seemed to conveniently exclude the entire chaotic police response to the emergency, which went on far longer than just nine minutes after the football match was stopped. Many believed that Popper had chosen this arbitrary timeline because he was too close to the police, 
and was trying to validate their version of events. Following the verdict, Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield was retired from the South Yorkshire Police on a full pension. Determined to continue to seek justice for those that had died during the tragedy, the grieving families of the victims, as well as survivors and other supporters, formed the Hillsborough Family Support Group. The group campaigned tirelessly for what they perceived as proper justice to be done, trying to get the original verdict of accidental death to be overturned. They were first able to achieve some limited success in 1997, when Home Secretary Jack Straw ordered another investigation to be performed by Lord Justice Stuart Smith. However, this ended similarly to the events of 1991. Stuart Smith supported the coroner's conclusion that evidence after 3.15 p.m. on the day of the tragedy was inadmissible because the main cause of the disaster was over, and said that there was no reason for a second judicial inquiry. In early 2000, private prosecutions were brought against Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield and another officer named Bernard Murray. The argument was that the disaster was foreseeable and that therefore the officers had been grossly negligent. However, these proceedings ended with Murray being acquitted and the jury unable to reach a verdict concerning Duckenfield. It wasn't until 2009, around the time of the 20th anniversary of the disaster, that the British government decided to act further. They created what was called the Hillsborough Independent Panel, which was responsible for investigating and overseeing the disclosure of documents about the disaster and its aftermath, with the goal of producing a report. This report was finally finished in September of 2012, and published on a website containing 450,000 pages of material. The findings of the Hillsborough Independent Panel went even further than those of the Taylor Report, concluding that no Liverpool fans were responsible in any way for the disaster, and that crowd safety was compromised at every level. The panel further found that up to 41 of the 96 deaths might have been prevented if the emergency response to the disaster had been better coordinated. This was based on post-mortem examinations of the victims, which found that many had critical organ function and blood circulation for some time after being removed from the crush. The panel also went further in scrutinizing the police, saying that they had deliberately altered at least 164 witness statements. The vast majority of those statements were found to have been altered specifically to remove or change negative comments about the South Yorkshire police. Evidence that officers had passed purposely misleading or untruthful information to the media was also uncovered. Unbelievably, it was discovered that the police had also performed blood alcohol tests on the victims, some of whom were children, and run computer checks on the National Police database in an attempt to find information damaging to their reputations that they could use to back their narrative about hooliganism. The new bombshell report resulted in apologies for many people, including Prime Minister David Cameron and opposition leader Ed Miliband, on behalf of the government. The Sheffield Wednesday Football Club and the South Yorkshire Police also offered formal apologies. One party whose apologies were flatly rejected by the victims' families, survivors, and residents of Liverpool at large, however, were those of the Sun newspaper and its former editor, Calvin McKenzie. In the immediate aftermath of the smear stories against Liverpool fans, the paper was boycotted by customers and even retailers who refused to stock it throughout the county of Merseyside. According to reports, that boycott lasts to this day, and by some estimates has cost the Sun and its parent company £15 million a month since 1989. While the paper has apologized unreservedly for its coverage several times, the situation with Calvin McKenzie is a little fuzzier. He has definitely made public apologies over the years about his decision to run the infamous The Truth cover story. However, he has often angered people by continuing to couch these apologies in caveats. During one of these apologies, he said that his main mistake was believing Conservative MP Irvine Patnick. There are also reports that he later said at a private dinner in 2006 that he only apologized under the instruction of Rupert Murdoch, and that he wasn't sorry then, and he wasn't sorry now, for what he had published. Mackenzie aside, 
By the end of 2012, much of the public, and now the government, seemed to be on the side of the Hillsborough victims and their families. After an application by the Attorney General in December of that year, the High Court threw out the original inquest verdict and ordered new inquests to be held. In April of 2016, the jury returned a verdict of unlawful killing for all 96 victims of the tragedy by a majority of 7-2. to two. Following the new verdict, in June of 2017, it was announced that six people, including David Duckenfield, would be facing charges for their role in the Hillsborough disaster. Former Sheffield Wednesday Club Secretary Graham Mackerel was charged with safety offenses. Former South Yorkshire Police Chief Inspector Norman Bettison was charged with four counts of misconduct in public office. And three others within the South Yorkshire Police were charged with perverting the course of justice. The most serious charges, though, were leveled against Duckenfield. 95 counts of manslaughter by gross negligence. The only victim that Duckenfield wasn't charged for was Tony Bland, whose case reportedly couldn't be included because he had died more than a year and a half after the tragedy. Though in the eyes of many, it initially seemed like the time had finally come for justice for the Hillsborough victims, over the next couple of years, they would once again be disappointed. In 2018, the charges against Norman Bettison were dropped due to lack of evidence. And though in 2019, Mackerel was convicted on one of the health and safety charges, Duckenfield was found not guilty on all 95 counts of gross negligence manslaughter. The remaining three people were all found not guilty of perverting the course of justice in May of 2021. The decisions were understandably an enormous blow to those who had been fighting for over 30 years for these convictions. Around the same time that the last of the verdicts were given this year, the Hillsborough Family Support Group announced that they were disbanding, with one representative saying that they had gone as far as they could. In response to the acquittals, leader of the House of Commons Jacob Rees-Mogg called the lack of accountability over Hillsborough the greatest scandal of British policing in our lifetimes. As if to further emphasize the finality of the tragedy, just a couple of months after the last acquittals in July of 2021, the Hillsborough disaster would claim the life of its 97th and final victim, 55-year-old Andrew Devine. Andrew was just 22 years old when he suffered serious injuries during the tragedy that left him in a coma. Though he awoke nearly eight years later, he was left with severe and irreversible brain damage and required full-time care. Still, with the help of his family and friends, he was able to continue to attend football matches over the course of his life, and his home was even visited by the Liverpool bus during their 2019 parade after the team won the European Cup. After Andrew's death, he was also determined to have been unlawfully killed as a result of the injuries he sustained back in 1989. Andrew's death is a reminder of the pain and loss that is felt by all of those affected by the tragedy even more than 30 years later. Though it's unclear where, if anywhere, the fight for justice will go from here, it's certainly true that the memories of those who are lost will continue to live on. That brings us to the end of our list. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.